and then I'll, I'll make this. It looks like we're going to do it on iTunes. I don't know exactly how to do it yet, but the word from the the uh, technical people that are helping me with this is that we will put these on iTunes. So as soon as that's ready and available, I'll let you know about it. Um, until they're edited, I'm going to keep them closed from the general public so that only you guys can see them. So there'll have to be a login for that. And then after I edit them, make sure there's no references we're worried about it, so I'll probably make them just public to whoever wants to do them. So if you live in, uh, if you remember Ashley, yeah. she wants to she wants to watch them. So all right. Okay, so uh, this is dynamics. We're uh, we're taking a step beyond what most of us just did in statics. Uh, you missed that, Alex, but it's, it's not a big deal. What this really is, is kind of advanced Physics 1. Everything we did in Physics 1, we're going to do, and we're going to do it in greater detail and greater depth, and uh, 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 obviously a more mature, a little bit harder problem than what you did before. Um, dynamics in general, it, it's, it's a... Uh, a general term that we use to uh, indicate that there is going under uh, a system is undergoing a change, a change in state. And by system, we mean whatever it is we're working on, whether it's uh, the classic problem in here, pushing a crate across the floor. Or any of the type of things we're doing. But in general, dynamics means a change in state of a system. If it's a, a thermal system, it's most likely a change in state in temperatures or heat transfer. If it's a fluid system, of course, it's a change in state of some of the flow parameters. You looked a little bit at that for those of you that took physics too. We did that kind of thing. We're going to be concerned with uh, the general mechanics that we're talking about. This, uh, this statics and dynamics are both known as engineering mechanics courses. So when we refer to dynamics in here, we'll specifically mean the dynamics of engineering mechanics rather than the general term of dynamics that gets used in a lot of places chemical dynamic, chromodynamics, nuclear dynamics, all kinds of stuff that, of course, we won't look at. Statics was very specific in that we knew the sum of all the forces to be zero on any object, and therefore the acceleration was zero. We spent a whole term, Alex, doing just that. Well, there was a little bit more, if you remember, uh, when we summed the torques at the very end of Physics 1. Uh, that was also in there to, to make the angular acceleration also zero. But we spent a whole term doing just that. This term, well actually let me put in there also the sum of the torques is also zero. So that the angular acceleration is zero. Um, this term, we're going to have some other possibilities to look at. In general, uh, not always exclusively, the sum of the forces will be zero. Therefore, there will be some acceleration. In other words, the velocity won't necessarily be constant in this course because that's also an outcome of each of these. We will also look at situations where the torque is, the, the sum of the torques is not zero, and the uh, angular acceleration then also might not be zero. The thing about this is we can have either one of these conditions to be true, or both. We can certainly, we are certainly going to look at some problems where the forces sum to zero, but the torques do not. And we'll look at some problems where the torques sum to zero, but the forces do not. So 
we can say in here uh, maybe and or. The forces won't sum to zero, zero and or the torques won't sum to zero. We'll look at either possibility, either of those possibilities. Uh, also, the, certainly the possibility that both of them are zero. So that's our general study of what we call engineering mechanics. These two things we're looking at, we're now putting in the second of the courses in, uh, in what we generally call dynamics, but we specifically mean engineering mechanics dynamics. All right, we're going to be using an awful lot of stuff from Physics 1. So let's just review, refresh. For some of you, it's been uh, over a year since you had Physics 1. So it's going to be very helpful, I think, if we rehash a little bit of what we covered there. Uh, just to bring in, try to get it through the primordial ooze of your your sugar encrusted brains from a, another Christmas break. See if we can't bring up what we're talking about. If you remember, we started with the kinematics of particles and we will do so again. Two things of specifical interest to us there of course is what's the meaning of kinematics Do you remember? Motion. Study of motion itself. Not the causes of it, just what's going on in terms of where an object is, how fast it's moving, whether or not it's accelerating, and then of course, when each of these things is happening nothing in there about how any of these changes are occurring. And the change in state we're talking about mostly in dynamics is a change in V. If there's a change in V, there's automatically a change of position and there's automatically a uh, an acceleration. There may also be in this class a lot more instances where the acceleration is not constant, where most of what we did in physics one was constant acceleration. We'll do a little bit of that, uh, not exclusively that. And by particles, we mean that we're mostly concerned with where the center of mass of an object is. But so lightly concerned with it that a lot of the time we don't even mention it. We'll just understand that that's what we're talking about. If we're looking at where uh, a particular vehicle, whether it's a small vehicle like a human being or a very large one like the a, a, a space shuttle or something, we're not going to talk about where the individual pieces of it are and what position, velocity, acceleration they're undergoing, where we'll talk about the object as a single point and we'll a lot of times just automatically understand that uh, that will represent the entirety of what we need for the problem in terms of where it is and what it's doing. It may change its orientation in undergoing the problem. Early on here in the kinematics of particles, that will be a concern for us. Later on, we will be concerned with the orientation of the object. Just like we did in Physics 1, that's when we started talking about rotational motion and the like. After that, we looked at kinetics. This is when we concerned ourselves with the fact that if things are accelerating, how do we get that acceleration? If we don't want things to accelerate, how do we prevent that acceleration? Those are the kind of problems we looked at there, the causes of the kinematics. And that brought us to Newton's three laws. The first law is the one we used in statics, that the sum of the forces on an object 
will necessarily be zero. And just like in statics, if the sum of the forces is zero, the acceleration is zero. If the acceleration is zero, the velocity is constant. So all of these problems were constant velocity problems. That's Newton's first law. Newton's second law is the possibility they don't sum to zero, and so that'll be the one we're most interested in this class. The fact that we are going to have acceleration, we are going to have problems of non-constant velocity. Not the case of what we did uh, just finished up in statics. And then Newton's third law doesn't come in an equation form. It's more of a, a qualitative thing. That's the, the business of action-reaction pairs. The deal that if I push on something, it pushes back on me with a force that's equal to mine in magnitude, opposite to mine in direction, and collinear. You know what collinear means? Not just the same direction. It's even more specific than that. Because two forces that are equal and opposite could be like that. Collinear is more specific in that not only are they equal and opposite, but they're actually lined up with each other. They're in the same direction. These are not two forces that cancel each other because these are two forces on completely different objects. If I push on the wall, that's one of the forces. The wall pushing back on me with an equal opposite and collinear force is a different force on a different object. So those are not two pairs of forces that automatically cancel each other. So those are the two of the things, or uh, yeah, two of the things that we'll start with that will uh, be very important to us from Physics 1. Other things we need to remind ourselves with and concern ourselves, pay attention to, of course, are our units in problems. For the most part, the units will be very, very similar to what they were before. Uh, our fundamental units, our fundamental mass unit will be the kilogram. There is an English mass unit that we'll pay some attention to. It's a tremendous pain in the butt, so we're not going to dwell on it a lot. Uh, as with most of the English system, it's um, uh, historically very rich, scientifically uh, almost useless. So we'll talk about it some, uh, but we'll minimize the trouble of it. I'm going to depart a little bit from what the book does with it, just to make it even easier to do, um, to handle mass in English units. We, of course, also have length, our fundamental units will be me uh, meter and foot. Uh, in general, we'll try to have our, our problems come out in these units. Um, not necessarily always, it's, it's not necessary that they always be in just these fundamental units. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, subunits we can use centimeters and inches and the like and we will do so. And then our third fundamental unit, and it's the only one that's the same for both English and SI systems, and that's the, the second will be our fundamental unit. Lots of others we're going to use in this class that we introduced and used in Physics 1 that are derived units. For example, the derived unit for force, of course, is the Newton. which is derived from a particular and useful combination of, of the other units. 
part of the trouble with the English system here is that there is a force unit in the English system, of course, called the pound. It was not derived from the other English units as we did in the SI system. It was just defined independently and then had to be back defined in terms of all the other units. And that's where the tremendous mess comes in to play for the uh, SI or the English system, especially when we're talking about mass and force, which we all know go together all the time, especially in these classes. So we're going to have to pay attention to that. But it's not too difficult. Um, the only time it'll be difficult dealing with mass and force in the English system is if you don't write your units in your problem as you go along. If you're lazy about it, and don't always put them in, you're going to get caught. There's nothing I can do about it. If you put the units in, they'll take care of themselves and you'll do just fine with it. So, you make the decision how you want to approach the units. I've, uh, I've tried over the years to, to help you with it. Some of you I can help, some of you I can't. All right, so we're going to pay attention to those. Uh, there's others to learn, of course, a lot of other derived units that we've got uh, work and energy units of the joule. Remember how that was defined? We defined it off of a uh, newton meter, so it's a derived unit off of a derived unit. Um, there'll be others, and we'll define them and get used to them uh, as we go and as we need to. All right, other skills we're going to need from Physics 1 that we worked on, we're going to use a lot here. Um, we're going to do a lot in this class with vectors. They're particularly, particularly useful when talking about things like position, velocity, acceleration, and force because those are such um, th those are, those are uh, variables that depend so much on the very things that a vector can show. Everybody, I hope, remembers the three things that all vectors have. Poor Frank's over there going, oh, I know two things all vectors have. I can't think of a third. So give us two things all vectors have. Uh, direction. direction, which is very much a part of things like position, velocity, acceleration, and force. Uh, Though any of those things done in a different direction, you completely change the problem. So we have to pay attention to that a lot. Uh, length. length or in terms of uh, what it's describing, we use the term magnitude uh, because we will have force vectors and it doesn't make sense to draw something of a particular length unless we term it in terms of magnitude so we can have a vector of a particular length that represents a certain number of newtons, that'll be fine. And the third thing, Frank? Yeah, let's see. Let's see if my old students know. Everybody know three things? What? You think so? TJ? Uh, Colin? Three things. All vectors have. Well, with one minor exception that we get to. Yes. Units. All vectors have units. The magnitude you put on a vector won't mean anything if it doesn't have units as the same with any other number in this class or any of your other engineering classes. If you don't put the units on them, then the numbers themselves are useless. They don't mean anything to anybody if we don't know what the units are. Um, of course, one other concept, kind of bringing all of these together, the units, the kinetics, and the vectors, um, is the special, special case of uh, when we talk about weight. We will, of course, do what we did before with calculate the weight generally at the surface of the Earth. 
So we'll use G defined as 9.81 meters per second squared. That's the strength of the gravitational field. For those of you, uh, you guys are taking, most of you are taking physics three right now. So you'll, you'll be generally touching, it's your first time to touch things like, uh, like uh, continuum fields and the like, magnetic field, electric fields. Uh, gravitational field is just still the very same thing. Uh, what this G is, is the strength of the gravitational field, average strength of the gravitational field at the surface of the Earth. And we'll use that. That'll be just fine. We can also do it in English units. Uh, in general, those are the numbers we use. In fact, this is so um, common to us. In a problem that we're doing, if we have mass, but we need weight, we will not consider weight to be a separate unknown. We'll just take it as something we can so easily get that if we have mass, we'll assume we know weight and keep moving through the problem, and vice versa. Uh, and if, as you remember, most of what we have to do in these classes is, what you have to do is get enough equations to solve for all the unknowns. We're not going to consider weight as a separate unknown because it's just so easy to find. Um, we'll take it as that. We will also take weight to be generally downward because it is uh, a gravitational attraction to the Earth itself, and that's where the Earth is. So we'll leave it at that. We're not going to make a big deal about it. We won't, uh, we won't belabor that too much. Okay, a little bit more in terms of uh, what we're approaching here. Um, the homework assignments, uh, most of you remember, and so I'll introduce this to Frank. I should have done this in, in strength and materials too because the deal is the same there. I don't grade them specifically for your solutions. I have the solutions and my mind will go completely blank if I have to read over everybody else's solutions in great detail. So I will look at them for uh, almost exclusively for presentation. How well do you write out a solution? One of the things you need to learn most strongly as young engineers is how to communicate technical ideas. One of the m most common ways you're communicating with me in this class is through homework solutions. So do a good job with them. Uh, there's stuff on Angel about that in specific. There's even some samples up there. And then uh, that makes the grading for me a lot more useful. And then I will post the solution so you can then check your answers. So that's going to be the same type of thing we'll do in this course that we've done in years past. But there's some more stuff to help in, in this book on page 13. Um, by the way, did everybody get a chance to get this book? Okay, it's coming. Yeah, if you, if you won't have it for a couple days because you get it on, on uh, eBay or something, I don't blame you. Uh, it's a good book. Part of it, like, I wouldn't use a book that wasn't a good book, but I also like this one, just like the statics book that went with it. It's just a lot cheaper for you. It's a lot less expensive. Book. You're getting as much for what's the price? Eighty bucks for this? You ever take a little bit? You're getting as much as that. Other books are two hundred bucks, and they're not giving you anything more. Other than they're hard, hardbound, and this is paperback. Uh, big deal. I don't think that's worth uh, an extra hundred and twenty bucks. All right, so on page 13 of this book is, is a, a short discussion, doesn't take even the full page, on, on a way to approach problems. If you get used to that, these problems will just become a lot easier. Some of what we go into in, in dynamics seems very confusing, but if you approach it systematically, you can bro break down big confusing problems into little non-confusing problems that are all tied together in some way. And uh, dynamics very much lends itself to that as something we'll need to do. Part of 
virtually every solution in this class will be a free body diagram. If we're going to figure out how things are accelerating, we're going to need to know what the forces on these things are. The best way to get all of the forces is to do a free body diagram. So much so that, uh, as most of you know, we're starting that technical freehand sketching course. Uh, in fact, it starts immediately after that. To aid in this very kind of thing is to draw uh, a useful diagram for yourselves that will make the solution, getting to the solution, that much easier. In general, only two things you need to do. Make them big. If your drawings are too small, they're not going to be helpful. And that will very much be true in this class. We're going to have several problems with a lot of things going on. Several forces or several velocities. There are all kinds of different things, different places. And if your drawing's too small, it's just not going to help you. In fact, it most likely will hurt you. So don't be afraid to make them big. And Keep them simple. Don't put too much stuff in them either. Uh, as we put in, as we go through some of these problems, we're going to have not just forces that we're paying attention to, but acceleration and velocities. And if you put too many of these things on the diagram, they get too cluttered. They may be big, but if there's too much stuff in them, then effectively they're too small again. So there's some stuff we're going to have to selectively put in there, and others not. Um, it's a big help that uh, if you have uh, even a couple different colored pens or pencils with you, uh, that way we can draw force vectors in one color and velocity or acceleration vectors in another. One thing we're going to be doing in this class occasionally is not just have a force free body diagram, but we'll have an acceleration free body diagram as well. In that we know what the acceleration is that we want to result we got to get the forces that guarantees us that. So sometimes we'll draw a separate diagram that just has the acceleration on it to help us visualize where the forces are going to need to be to get just that acceleration. All right. Um, after we uh, get through that business, the kinematics of particles and and. Uh, the kinetics of particles, then we'll restart the whole thing with rigid body dynamics. And this will be the case just like it was in Physics 1, where now we were concerned with the size and the orientation of the different objects we're looking at. In Physics 1, we looked at pure rotation. In this class, we're also going to look at rotation and translation together. In physics one, anytime something was rotating, moving as a, as a rigid body, it stayed in one place and simply rotated. In this class, we're going to allow things to rotate and translate, just like uh, the easiest example is exactly what a car tire does. As a car tire rolls along the road, it's both rotating and translating through space. And so we're going to do both of those together. And that's why we're going to have to pay attention to both the sum of the forces and the sum of the torques. All right, so that will bring us down then to uh, the end of the term in general, the things we need to retain, hopefully you have to retain from Physics 1. Questions so far? Alex, you okay with that? Like I said, it's sort of advanced Physics 1. So if you did okay in Physics 1, which all of you did, you'll do okay here. All right.
So we'll make our start now into the kinematics of particles. Alright, we're going to divvy this up in a couple different ways. Uh, we're going to look at rectilinear motion. This is very simply straight line motion. We're not going to worry about any turns. It's just simple uh, travel to and fro on a single straight line. Just to begin things, just to get things moving, sort of open things up. We'll then make a step to curvilinear motion, where now things can take a bit of a turn as a possibility. However, we're going to keep it all in a single plane. So this will be 2D motion or planar motion. It's exactly what we did in Physics 1. This is when we looked at things like projectile motion, um, circular motion. Those are, those are two-dimensional motions that are always in a single plane. So we'll do some more of those. Circular or orbital motion. Uh, and then just general two-dimensional motion of, of various kinds. And we'll spend a little bit of time, a little bit more than we did in Physics 1, but not an awful lot, into general 3D motion. <clears throat> what are sometimes called space coordinates. We won't spend a lot of time there. It's difficult to draw on the board. It's difficult for you to draw on your papers. It's uh, difficult times to even visualize, much less take notes about. So we'll, we'll spend some time with it, but not an awful lot. We'll also look at a type of motion we call relative motion. We looked at it a little bit in Physics 1. We'll look at it a little bit more, a little bit more in depth here. Relative motion is also known as two or more body motion. Two objects and how they move with relation to each other. That motion might be unconstrained. This is the type of two body motion we're most familiar with as people because as you move anywhere you happen to move through your day, you're moving relative to somebody else, but they're moving however they feel like moving without concern of what you're doing, other than you don't want to smack into each other in the hallway, or you might be boyfriend and girlfriend and you like to hold hands as you walk. But at any time you can separate and go your separate ways, and there's no connection between the two in terms of the motion of one directly affecting the motion of another. We will also look at constrained motion. <clears throat> this is where the two bodies are directly connected to each other in some way, whether it's by magnetic forces, electrostatic forces, or actually physically, mechanically connected to each other as two things would be if connected by a rope. Um, or some other, some other direct force and connection. All right, that'll be our start here, and that'll take us down to exam number one, as you'll see on the schedule. All right.
Any questions? Most of that already is chapter one. So uh, already we're, we're set to go on to chapter two as we start talking about rectilinear straight line motion. Um, the, the kinematics we're worried about again are, well first we're worried about the position of something. Where an object is at a particular time where it is at other times as well. And between that, those two things, we're going to try to figure out uh, what else is going on with the object. So generally, we need some kind of straight line upon which our object can travel. It cannot go off of that path in the study of rectilinear straight line motion, obviously, since it's straight line motion nor does that path turn in any way. So we need some straight line that defines the motion, whether it's a, uh, some kind of rail track or just uh, some other physical constraint that keeps it on the straight line. doesn't matter as long as it does. One other thing we need of any of these team type of things is an origin from where we measure the position. just simply a way for us to reference the position with respect to some point, preferably some point that we can all agree on so that when one person is talking about position, it's meaningful to the other person in the very same way. If we didn't have the same origin, then when you talked about the position of an object, it doesn't mean anything to me because I'm measuring it from some other, some entirely different place. Um, hopefully most of you remember the one rule about where this origin must be. When we pick an origin, we put it where? It doesn't matter where. That's the one rule. It's going to be arbitrarily located. All it needs to be is publicly known. If you pick an origin, it needs to be understood where that origin is by the other people. Other than that, it's entirely arbitrary where it is. Because we're not so much concerned with the position of the object as we are with the change in the object's position. Because that's what uh, results from velocity and that's what uh, also then leads to acceleration. So we have some origin, some kind of unit system uh, that goes with it, whether that's meters or miles or nanometers, doesn't matter. S generally we have some understood positive and negative direction. If unspecified, We'll take positive to be to the right, positive to be up, just because we're so used to that. Certainly in, in Western cultures, we're used to that. It's a little bit different in some other cultures, but that's what we'll take it to be unless we specifically say otherwise. All right, so at any one time, we can have an object at some position we might call S1 at some time T1. Since we know where the origin is, since we know what our unit measuring system is, we can all agree on where the object is at that time. Vitally important in, in science and engineering and physics that we all agree on what we're talking about before we even talk about how those things are changing. Some bit of time later, of course, it might have moved to some other spot and is now here at some other time. That's as simple as rectilinear straight line motion can possibly be. Of course, there's the possibility 
we could move backwards with our next step. Doesn't matter, we can always handle that type of thing. We can go anywhere we want along that line. All we're concerned about is where are we and when are we there. Because from that, then we get our first important idea, that of average velocity. That's change in position that occurs during a certain amount of time. Exactly like we had it in Physics 1. Uh, we're going to be very specific from the start. We'll, take, uh, we'll, we'll pay attention to the fact that this is a vector equation. In rectilinear motion, that's not a big deal. All that comes into in the direction business is whether it's a plus or a minus. If we move to the right, our delta S is plus. If we move to the left, our delta S is negative. And that will handle the full vector nature of both change in position and velocity that goes with it. We will always take delta T to be positive. We're not going to talk about any idea of traveling back in time. This is in the physics class. If you want to travel back in time, you have to major in physics, get a PhD, or, well, Mr. Peabody didn't have a PhD. Do you know, everybody know who Mr. Peabody is? <sighs> Mr. Peabody and Sherman and the Wayback Machine? Do you know who Rocket J. Squirrel is and Bullwinkle Moose? Man. I don't know who I'm going to be teaching in the years to come if you guys don't even, golly, you don't even know who Mr. Peabody is. Well, go Google Mr. Peabody. That sounds nasty in its own right, right there. All right. Um, so, uh, it's, this is very simple to do. You do this exact kind of thing in your head on the fly as you travel places during the day. So, it's not a tremendously big deal. What's more of concern to us is this idea that if we pay attention to what our position is at certain times, and so uh, we happen to know it's there, and then we happen to know it's there, and then we happen to know it's there, kind of like what we did up here. We had three different positions that at, as time went by at T1, 2, and 3, we were a little bit to the right of the origin, a little bit farther to the right, and then we came back to the left. Uh, what's more of concern is not what the average velocity might be for any one of these. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a pretty gross measure at times. If T1 and T2 are pretty far apart in time, it doesn't tell us a whole lot of what went on in between. So we might have more interest to know what the object did at some of the intermediate times that are missed by the fact that we have this gross uh, delta T here that uses a pretty big time step and doesn't always give us the type of detail we need. Maybe we need to know not what the average velocity is between two times, but what the instantaneous velocity is at a specific time. And uh, if you're looking at this, you may recognize this as we're right on the cusp of what's known as the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you recognize that. It says that the average velocity over a certain time step, there's guaranteed to be at least one spot in between that has that same velocity. Somewhere in between the instantaneous velocity is going to have the same slope as the average velocity does at the end points of that, that uh, time period. It was exactly this type of problem. What, how do we define the instant velocity? How do we come to understand 
at some particular time, how can we have any velocity when at a particular time, at an instant in time, we can't actually move anywhere? If we're if we're if we have if no time goes by, how can any motion go by? So how can there be such a thing as instantaneous velocity? This was exactly the type of problem that Galileo and Leibniz wrestled with. This idea that as the time step approaches zero, what happens to the velocity? Because the velocity was defined based upon a, a a, uh, a definite delta t, a, a finite delta t, not an infinitesimally small delta t, like we're talking about here. So this was our idea of the instantaneous velocity. Hopefully all of you recognize that as the derivative. And it was exactly this idea of the instantaneous velocity that led both Galileo and Leibniz separately to their definition of the uh, instantaneous velocity, to the definition of the derivative. Which to us, very simply, is the slope of the position curve at any one particular point, the, tan the slope of that tangent line. We will, in this class, also make use of an, a, an alternative uh, notation. We're concerned with changes in the position vector. We'll designate that at times with just a dot up above it. That, uh, that is uh, universally known as indicating a time rate of change in whatever that quantity is. And that's exactly what we have, the time rate of change of the position vector, also known as S dot. And, and will be said that way. If you, if you uh, talk to other engineers, you say S dot, they'll know then exactly what you mean with just that. So we'll use that. And uh, uh, make not exclusive use of it, but uh, we will make particular use of it when it is useful. In 2D, 2 and 3D motion, it can be very useful to use the dot notation because then we can write x dot is the velocity in the x direction, y dot is the velocity in the y direction. And we can keep them uh, uh, simple and straight that way. All right, hopefully that looks familiar to most everybody. All right, then we looked at changing velocity itself. The fact that the problem is a little bit more interesting when not just the position's changing, but the rate at which the position's changing itself also occurs over some time period. And we understand uh, and remember this to be the uh, acceleration, the average acceleration. The rate at which the velocity is changing as some particular time period goes by. What are points one and two we can define for any problem as we wish. It is a vector quantity, like all the others we've talked about so far. Well, time, I guess it could be a vector. It does have direction, but it only has one direction. It only can go forward, only go to the right down the, down the uh, time axis. Just like we did with the velocity, we might also concern ourselves with the instantaneous acceleration. Define in exactly the same way that as this time period approaches zero, 
which is the perfect definition of an instant in time. We then get the instantaneous acceleration. And again, this is just the time rate of change of the velocity vector. Using our notation, we can also write v dot. Since v itself is a derivative, then we can take out the velocity and replace it with the time rate of change of the position vector then this is also known as the second derivative of the position with respect to time. Or we can also write it as s double dot. Standard notation, any one of those, if you choose so to use one in the exclusion of the others, that's fine. I recognize any one of these. And you're welcome to do which one you want. You just have to do it correctly. That's the only thing. If I put up a notation that uh, you don't quite understand, just ask for clarification. Um, don't want, don't mean any of this to be particularly confusing. All right. So that's all review. I hope. Now we're going to get a little bit more specific, stuff we didn't quite hit in any great detail in Physics 1, because if we didn't do more stuff than we did in Physics 1, there'd be no point in taking this course. So let's, uh, let's go into all of this in a little bit more detail. We're going to be interested in three cases. Three possible ways these rectilinear kinetic kinematic problems can shake out. Actually, it doesn't necessarily have to be rectilinear. It could be uh, curvilinear and space, spacilinear, I guess. Uh, but we're interested in three possible cases. Not in any particular order, but those are the acceleration is known as a function of time in, the, in some problems. That's one possibility. As time goes by, we know what the acceleration is. From that, we want to get the rest of the details. What's the velocity? What's the position at any of the t points in time? Second possibility we'll look at, and remember, it's not in any particular order, just the order in which I happen to do them. Acceleration as a function of position. <clears throat> Remember, these can all be, uh, and properly should be, I guess, as, as vectors, full vectors, but uh, we'll just use the plus and the minus. Don't have to fuss with the vector signs right now. We will, uh, of course, when we look into 2 and 3D motion, but for right now, uh, hopefully we can understand that, that even though these are vectors, all we need is a plus and a minus in rectilinear motion. The other possibility is that velocity is a function, uh, sorry, acceleration is a function of velocity. Any one of those three could be a possible, possible way a problem could shake out. And from those, we're trying to figure out more about the problem, maybe uh, what the position is maybe what the velocity are, maybe the, the time that happens in any of these problems that goes in between them. So those are the three cases we'll look at. Case one, that of acceleration as a function of time. How do we take a problem like that and, and glean out of it something about the velocity, something about the position. Easiest way is to start with our definition of acceleration. Collect variables. 
since acceleration is a function of time, we want it to be with the time variable itself. So we'll move things around a little bit. Just some simple differential algebra, if you will. And then, of course, uh, this is just crying out to be integrated. Integrated between V1 and V2, since that's the uh, variable of integration. And from T1 to T2. I'll trust you to integrate this side. Who's done? Has anybody integrated this side yet? Remember when you first learned differentials, what the name of the integral was? You weren't told the term integral. You were called, it was called antiderivative. Integrals undo derivatives. So then this is then simply integrated to V between the limits of V1 and V2. Is that the symbolism you use for the limits on the integration? Evaluating the limits? Uh, well, we can't do this integral if we don't know what the acceleration function is with time, so we're going to have to leave this one alone. But this one we can condense a little bit. Uh, that becomes then V2 minus V1 or delta V. Let me do it this way. Be a little more general. Remember that Acceleration is a function of time. That doesn't mean times time. It means it's a function of time. And so there's our solution for case one. If we know acceleration is a function of time, then we can fairly easily, depending on just what that function is, determine what the change in velocity is. So as an illustrative example, uh, we've got some function of acceleration with time. Whatever it happens to be, whatever is causing that, who knows, there's lots of things in, that we can insert here. between any two points in time we're concerned with, T1 and T2, we can figure out what the change in velocity is between those two times if we know this function. Whether we know it as a mathematical function or whether we know it as a graphical function doesn't matter. The integral in terms of the graphic gives us when you integrate a curve, you get the area under the curve. So the area under this curve is the change in velocity between those same two times. If we know what the velocity is at one of the times, we then of course can figure out the velocity at the other time. And we can change those times, we can make them as small or as large as we want and figure out as much detail about the velocity as we could possibly want. So this will give us the area under the AT curve. It may be easier to actually just calculate that area than it will be to actually do the integration. All right, simple as it was, that's case one.
case two, that's where acceleration is a function of position. All right, let's see. We're going to have to bring two things together here. Uh, remember that A itself equals dV dt. That was just simply our definition of the instantaneous acceleration. So that's certainly true. And the other thing we remember is V is equal to dS dt. Those, things, those two things are always true. No matter what the functional form of acceleration, these two things, of course, are always true. No matter what the motion is, we know those things to be true. So let's do this. Let's see. Uh, let's move this around a little bit. Make this dv, uh, sorry, dt equals dv over a. We'll do the same type of thing with this one. This becomes dt equals ds over v. Since those two things are always true, and they're both happening at the same time, we can combine them because they're both equal to dt, and it's the same dt for each. So we'll just bring these together. They both equal dt. They both must equal each other. So dv over a must equal ds over v. Or a ds. Remember, this was a problem where a was a function of position. We now have it in that form. We could integrate this if we wanted to equals V dV. Or we could write it as S double dot DS equals S dot DS dot. If we know acceleration is a function of position, uh, sorry, yeah, acceleration is a punch of, function of position, then this is the solution, this, this is the method with which we'll be able to figure out what's happening with the velocity. All right, we can do a little bit more with that. I'm going to leave that there just so we have it for reference. We can do just a little bit more with that. ABS equals V dV. We can integrate this from S1 to S2. Integrate this one from V1 to V2. The left hand side well, if we don't exactly know what this, uh, if, if at this instant, we don't, this moment, we don't happen to know what the accelerational function is on position, uh, then we can't actually do this integral. We could, we could do it graphically, um, but we'll leave it, we'll leave it as just an integral we have to do once we have the functional form between those two. With that right hand side, we can integrate. That right hand side, you can integrate. The integral of V dV. Who's my, my integrating genius here? Uh, almost. Remember that. Increase the power by one, bring that power down, so we'll have one half V squared between the limits V1 and V2. So that comes, uh, the one half comes out. We've got 
v2 squared minus v1 squared kind of looks like uh, we're right on the edges of, uh, of kinetic energy. If you remember, 1 half v squared was a big part of that. In fact, we can finish that link in a little bit. Um, it's always necessary for me to do this, so I'll do it. This is change in v squared. We have v squared at point 2, we have v squared at point 1. We're subtracting them, this is the change in v squared. This is not equal to the change in v squared. Don't mix that up. And usually about a third of the students do. I got eight people here, so two of you are going to screw that up. If you'd like to volunteer right now, so we know who that is. No? We'll leave it as a surprise for later. So, this then tells us that the area under the AS curve whatever that might look like or whether we actually know that function have it written out. We'll do a problem like this in a, in a second. That between those two times the area under that curve is the change in v squared. So if we know acceleration as a function of position, we can then fairly quickly get to an understanding of what the change in the velocity is. Directly, we get the change in velocity squared, but from that, we can get the change in velocity. step away from it, especially if we have to remember the one half is in there. Now we'll do case three, the acceleration as a function of velocity. This is a very realistic situation because this is exactly the type of thing that goes on when you don't neglect air resistance. Remember in physics one, almost everything we did, we neglected air resistance. When you don't neglect air resistance, acceleration becomes very much a function of the speed. As you know, the faster you drive down the highway, the more the air is rushing over the car, the more your gas mileage drops. All of those things are, are part of the velocity. It doesn't really matter what your position is in those situations. It matters whether or not you're driving real fast. So that's that's a, a very realistic, but a much more complicated situation. So we'll deal with some of it here. 
Uh, the thing is, with this one, there's two possibilities. Excuse me. There's two possibilities that can sprout from here. We have to handle them each a little bit differently. This one, say we, what we want to find out is how much time is going by. As an object is accelerating with an acceleration that depends upon the velocity itself, maybe what we need to figure out is delta t. Maybe what we need to figure out is the change in position. So those are two possibilities we need to work out, and we have to do them separately. Neither one's terrifically complicated, but they don't have the overlap that the others did. All right, so we'll do, we'll do this first part here. We need delta t. For some reason, that's, that's the, the way the problem was, was uh, laid out for us. Well, uh, we have a pretty good link of them with just the definition of acceleration. Right there, we have acceleration and velocity linked. So we can rearrange this a little bit in a way that's collecting the variables. If you remember doing that when you were learning about integration, we have the integrate variable of integration is our velocity and our functional dependence is um, velocity. So it's good to put those two things together. Then we can integrate both sides. The left hand side just becomes delta t. So there's what we're looking for in the first place. And then, uh, well, we can't do anything with this unless we know what the uh, functional dependence is there and we could actually do the integration. So that's, that's the uh, general solution to the first possibility of our third case. If we knew how A depended upon B, we could do that integration. It's not as easy as just calculating the area under the AV curve because this is dV over A, not A dV, but uh, you can always graph 1 over A as a function of V. All right, so there's that possibility there as we look through this. The other possibility that we need delta s. All right, let's see. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, let's see, a is a function of v, but as we know from, uh, what was it? As we know from case, uh, yeah, from case two, we know that um, that this part is this is from a ds equals v dv. That was our solution to case two. We're looking for delta s, but a is a function of v, so we'll recollect variables a little bit here. Separate variables, I guess the term is. We'll get the ds on one side. Remember, that's what we're looking for, so you can already tell that's where our integration is going to be. And this is uh, v over a dv. Remember that a itself is a function of v. So those are not two constants divided by each other. That's a variable and a function of that variable dividing each other. So we can integrate both sides. We directly get our delta s there.
integrate the other side and uh, at this point actually there's not much we can do with that because we don't know what this at this point we don't know what the functional dependence is of A on DB so we'll just have to leave it like that until we do know until we do know what that that dependence is and then you can just do the integration if A is some polynomial of V or what's most common in um, fluid mechanics is A is either a direct proportionality to V squared or V cubed depending upon the situation then that's a fairly easy integral to go ahead and put that functional form in and finish the integral. All right, that brings us to the end. What we'll do on Friday is we'll relook at some of these for a quick special case and then uh, continue it from there. Okay, um, there's homework assigned. There's quite a few problems, but you have until Friday to do them, so get started on them. You know, they're not due Friday, but uh, keep on top of them so you don't get behind. Nope, about the only way to fail one of my courses is to not turn the stuff in. <laughs>